mean, it's it's three of my coaching clients have come from that uh, ebook. Yeah. Okay, I think we're on. It says you're connected. So, uh, well, wait, let me see. let me just double check this and make sure. Yeah, no, that's we'll talk about that after after the uh, yeah. It's, after this. YouTube says it's still waiting on Rob. Okay, so let's just wait till we're we're hundred percent. I don't know if you saw the video I shared of yours today, but man, that was so on point, dude. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that once we go live here. Oh yeah, that was yeah yeah yeah. I did see the one with uh, Brad. Yeah. That dude's got a story too. Fresh. YouTube says we're still waiting. There's always a, a delay on this. It's hard to it's hard okay. to time it perfectly. We're coming up now. Okay, good. Yeah, it got the tail end of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gave, gave away the secrets to writing books to everybody. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I tell everybody that. All right. Let's get into it. Let me introduce you. So Frank Rich, thank you for coming on the show. Frank is a former bodybuilder. He's an entrepreneur men's health coach and host of the superhuman life podcast after living with and battling addiction depression and anxiety for almost 20 years he is now on a mission to help men who are suffering with many of the same issues take back control of their lives through the power of faith and fitness frank has helped thousands of men transform their physiques through his online coaching platform where he provides content programs and services to men looking to build more muscle drop body fat and build their greatest bodies he is also the founder and CEO of Rebuilt Recovery, a company based on growth-centric holistic approach to addiction recovery. Rebuilt Recovery provides fitness training for men going through recovery, as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching for men aiming to break free from porn addiction. His goal is, th is that by being open and transparent with his struggles and having real and, raw and, real and raw conversations with others who have overcome adversities, that he can empower you to face your darkness, take control, and ultimately create the life you've always dreamed of, your own superhuman life. Welcome to the Kowalski Ski Analysis, brother. Bro, excited, uh, excited to be here, man. Thank man, you. Thank, thanks for coming on the show, dude. I've been excited to have this conversation with you. I, I really have too, man. I've, I've, I've shared with everybody that I've met. I'm like, I met this dude, Rob. Like, we hit it off right from the beginning, and it's only the start of some really big things to come, man. So, super excited. We've had incredible responses and feedback from your conversation on, on my show, and I'm just excited to continue with wherever we're going to go tonight. Yeah, man, me too. I, I love your story. Uh, I love your transparency. I've been listening to a lot of your, your podcast, uh, getting ready for the interview tonight. And I just love that you're just basically pull your pants down to your ankles and you're like, this is what it is. You know? well, dude, I was a bodybuilder, man. So I, I stood <laughs> on stage in my underwear in front of, you know, like willingly uh, to be judged. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the vulnerability side, I, for the longest time, my bodybuilding was a shield. Mm. You know, the physique that I built was a way for me to guard what was really going on inside from the outside. Um, and then we'll get into it tonight. I'm sure, you know, my life really changed when I, when I really opened the door and brought people in and said, Hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Mm. This is, this is what I've been going through. And just, just those conversations and, and that vulnerability. And you know, I've used a, the the words you know when you open your heart you know to the world like your life can change and, and transform so that's that's what i do with the podcast that's you know that's that's what we shared with with your conversation and um yeah i think we're all broken and, and we all have um you know weaknesses and it's it's about being transparent and realizing like we don't all have this figured out so let's let's lock arms and go about it together yeah it's refreshing though like you, you, it seems very natural for you to be transparent so it's hard to it's hard to imagine that you yeah, one one time had this dark secret, you know, because it doesn't seem like you're, you know, like it just now it just seems like it's just who you are. But take people back a little bit. Let them know, you know, childhood, you know, kind of a little bit about Frank Rich, because there's there's people obviously watching that don't know who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you. know, thank you for that for that intro. Um, I mean, you you really nailed it. But 
um, you know, I'll take it, I'll take it back to, cause I think the first part of that was former, former bodybuilder. So for a long part of my life and really my entire adult life from, you know, 18 to, to 35, like that was how I identified in, in the world, um, you know, was through bodybuilding was through fitness, um, you know, going back a little bit further. So, so childhood, you know, I, I grew up as an athlete competitive, um, um, the, the middle child of, of three, uh, the oldest boy. So, um, a little bit younger than you, but, uh, you know, I'm eighties, nineties kids. So, so back then we didn't have the world that these kids are growing up today. So we spent our, we spent our childhood outside. If we weren't, you know, playing baseball on the street, we were, you know, we were causing ruckus somewhere, but, but that was me. I was, I was an athlete. Um, but I, I struggled from very young age. I mean, 10, 12 years old with some insecurities. Um, you know, we traditional American family, you know, we, we ate dinner and it was kind of what was ever prepared out of a, out of a box. Um, so while we were very athletic and active, uh, what we were putting in, and, and I think this is just what my parents, you know, thought was, was best. So, um, so we didn't have a healthy kind of healthy nutrition kind of as part of our family. It was frozen pizzas, boxed macaroni for lunch, um, just whatever I could, you know, get my hands on traditional kind of American, American kid food. Um, you know, nobody in my family was really in great, great shape. Um, you know, everybody kind of carried around like your extra, you know, 20 to 25 pounds that kind of just became the norm. Um, but I knew from a very young age that that wasn't right, that there's, other people in the world that that look a lot different than everybody in my family um really got big into wrestling at a very young age ultimate warrior hawk hogan like when these guys were you know gladiator gladiator physique so i became very obsessed at a young age um with with the art of bodybuilding i mean i can remember even going back like saturday mornings when a lot of kids were watching cartoons i was watching espn bodybuilding and weightlifting shows right just sitting on the couch like you know with my cereal like watching watching dudes work out and flex um so when i uh when i was old enough to step foot into a gym uh it was world gym in in land lakes florida just north of tampa i can remember being 15 years old walking in there um and just being in awe like the you know pictures on the walls of the bodybuilders like we had some pro wrestlers that that lived in in our town and they train there. So like, I got to see these like superhero physiques and I instantly became obsessed. Um, somewhere back. Who was your Rock. favorite wrestler? Favorite wrestler. Um, well, I mean the, the rock when he, when he debuted in 96, Oh yeah, um, I was, uh, I was a, I was a, I was a Brett the Hitman heart fan though. I can remember doing the sharpshooter on my little brother, <laughs> like nice. just making him, making him just cry. But I, I was a wrestling fan, dude. I used to go to the Baltimore arena. So I, I lived in Brooklyn, which is basically like, it was like blacks and hillbillies, right? Like okay. that was, a, that was, the neighborhood. it was like projects and just, you know, white trash all went together, the neighborhood <laughs> together. And there was a lot of wrestling fans and I, we would go. And I remember the first time I went, I saw Sergeant Slaughter and like Rocky Johnson. And okay. I think, Ivan Putsky. So it was a little bit before that. I mean, I was little. I was little, little. Yeah. But then I started going to the matches, like by myself, and I would go and, you know, we would even like wait outside for them to come out. And mm. I remember the Tonga Kid and like, uh, you know, Ricky Steamboat and Jimmy Sn Superfly Snooker and all them. I, I remember The Rock too. Obviously, I got yeah. back into it when The Rock was was around. And he was just he really was electric, man. That guy when yeah. he came out, it was awesome. Well, dude, I, so I grew up, you know, I grew up here in, in, in Tampa, you know, and um, just until they opened up in Orlando, you know, what, 10, 10 years ago, like this was where the guys came up. So, you know, Hogan going back to the seventies has, has resided here in Tampa. He's still got a place in Clearwater. He's got his little Hogan's beach shop right there on the beach as well. But a lot of the like guys coming up, like the FCW, was I mean it was in warehouse just down in in South Tampa. So British uh, British Bulldog, um, he lived yeah. around the he lived around the street from me when I was when I was in high school um, on on one of the lakes up up there. So yeah, that was I mean I was going back you know years. It's it's funny because as I as I got into bodybuilding and 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 I actually became training partners uh, with somebody that was 
very high up in, in the WWE. We were best friends. We trained together. But I used to get asked all the time around here, because I'm 6'3", and I was, you know, 250, like, jacked. People would ask me all the time, like, are you a wrestler? Like, I just, I kind of, like, had that that persona. Sure. Um, and, and carried but, that Yeah, I'm sorry. Out. I derailed us a little bit. So when you were going back, though, when you were young, you were you were overweight. I was over, yeah, I was, I was overweight. Um, like, in well, a, like, chubby kid. Yeah, I mean, not not fat and obese. You know, we shopped in the husky section. You know, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna um, share my screen real quick. So I wanted people to see. Uh, I want people to see. Hold on, let me make sure I can even do this. Can I share my screen? Yeah, I can share my screen. I want people to see a picture of you when you were competing. I know that's not what this isn't what the com oh. <laughs> conversation is gonna be about, but uh, there he is. Yeah, that's that's one of my. So what are you there about? You about two two fifty two sixty? Uh, that's it. Well, that's a day after a show. Uh, I competed. I competed um, in the state of Florida. Classic physique. Placed fourth. Uh, at two, I had to. I had to weigh under two thirty two. So I weighed in at two two thirty one Friday night. I was probably two thirty five to two thirty seven on stage. So in that picture, I'm probably low two forties, but sub five percent. I mean. Right. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I was, I was the Husky, you know, I was a kid that didn't want to take his shirt off. Like, you know, not, not super obese. I mean, cause I was an athlete, so I was still highly athletic. I just, I had that extra like pinch. Um, sure. And, you know, idolizing guys with incredible physiques, like that's, I just wasn't, wasn't confident. So, so when I had the ability to step foot into a gym and, and this will, we'll, we'll see this in my story. Like I just went, all in. I went 100% all in on training, nutrition. I mean, I, I got the books, the Arnold Encyclopedia. I subscribed to all the magazines. It was protein powder and just doing whatever I possibly could, training twice a day. Um, so that was my kind of entry point into into bodybuilding. And, and that really became a part of my uh, identity as, as an adult. You know, um, it didn't matter what I was doing professionally, whether it was sales and, and I had a little stint in in corporate America, it was like any free moment I had was like learning bodybuilding, studying bodybuilding, training, doing, doing whatever. It just, I, it just became, became an obsession for me. Um, never dealing with that, that insecure child though, that, that was run, you know, it was running, yeah. uh, running away from something. Um, and we'll, I think we'll kind of get back, back to that. But beyond that, um, you know, my, my family home wasn't, it wasn't ideal. It wasn't great. Um, parents split when I was, when I was 15. And at that point I was given the choice, like, where do you, like, where do you want to like, and you don't give a 15 year old male, you know, an option of, of where he wants to live. So I knew which route was going to allow me to kind of live like a life of freedom. So I chose that route. So at 15, I kind of, really stepped into the world all on my own, you know, um, not that my dad wasn't there. We, we lived together, but in terms of a, a father figure, it, it wasn't really there. So here I was 15, kind of on my own high school. Um, and, and that's when kind of the world of partying just kind of, kind of became part of, part of my life. So, you know, 15, I was the kid that, you know, we'd throw the Friday night parties. My dad was, my dad was working a lot. So there's a lot of time where he wasn't there. So for this huge house parties at Frank's, you know, um, and, and that became really all of high school, you know, so sophomore, junior, senior, senior year, in addition to playing sports and all that, like the, the other part of me was, was being the life of the party, you know, like everybody come drink with me. And with that, like, let's smoke, let's do like, let's just bring it all, all here. Um, How old were you when you lost your virginity? I uh, was 16. Me too. That's how old I 16. was. 16. Um, in, in the woods, <laughs> in the back of a, the back of a Jeep. Not a. <laughs> <laughs> I, dude, honestly, I, so a couple of things you said, like, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about, I can't help but think about Black Lives Matter, this thing about their destruction of the nuclear family unit. That's part of their mission. And I'm like thinking to myself, that's a terrible idea. You know, like the reason I, I, I was such a bad kid and, and I started getting arrested at 12 years old and, you know, drinking young. And it's because I didn't have a dad. You know, he, there's nobody to bust my ass and, you know, to spank me sometimes mm -hmm. when I needed it or 
or just someone to be scared of or model what a what a real man looked like, you know, like versus just watching television, which is what I did. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 lack of fathers in the homes is a major, major problem, major in, in problem the world right now. I was watching a, I was watching one of my friends spoke at a church uh, this past week. And so I was, I was watching his uh, his talk um, and, and it wasn't 100 percent on fathers. It was more on uh, redefining masculinity yeah. uh, through Jesus. Uh, it's kind of like Jesus is the model of masculinity, um, but he was sharing some some uh, statistics, and it's like seventy two percent of uh, suicides are are men without fathers, and yeah. that number's shooting through the roof. Like when you when you run statistics on on the numbers in prison, it's something like eighty to eighty five percent of the men in prison uh, are coming from from homes without without fathers. Um, and I can remember going back to one of the first services uh, once once church opened back up after quarantine. Um, I was visiting uh, a local church with with some friends here, and it was all about how when the enemy is trying to you know trying to attack, like they they first go and to break up the home, right? And how everything that's going on um, in the world right now is that separation of the home and, and attacking the father. So yeah, it's evil. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a perfect example of, you know, you get a 15 year old kid without any real guidance and leadership and mentorship. And that can lead you down a path of, you know, decade plus of drugs, alcohol, partying, sex. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, very fortunate and blessed that I, I only had to spend two nights in jail um, nothing for any major. Um, but dude, there was, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of times that I was like this, you know, this close to, yeah. So tell me about what, when did the, when did the porn start? Was that something that kind of just, Oh dude, that started before, before training before, uh, probably, probably somewhere between six, six to seven years old. Um, wow. I can remember the first time finding, finding a magazine, um, you know, and it was, it was, it was my dad's actually, it's funny because it's not funny, but, <laughs> um, I remember when I, uh, when I broke free and I had the conversation with my mom, um, she shared a story with me, like I was five or six, like she found, like I'd stolen the magazines from my dad's drawer and I hid them under my bed at like six years old. Um, so it was, it was very, very young. Um, you know, and it, it wasn't as accessible as it, as it is today. It was like, we had to steal, you know, steal the magazine. So dad had them in the drawer. I can remember us, we had a, we had a fort out in the woods. Um, so we'd steal them from like this because back then, like you could just walk into a circle K and they'd have literally on the magazine rack, you could buy like a sports illustrated, you could buy a muscle and fitness. And then on the back rack behind like a black, like shield, would be like a hustler or like the hard, hardcore stuff. So we would go in there, you know, two kids would go kind of to the, to the cash register to buy the candy. Like one of us slips one in our pants and then we take it and leave it in the floor. And it was kind of just there for the neighborhood, neighborhood kids. Um, yeah. So yeah, introduction to porn came at a very, very young age. And then I can remember getting, uh, getting my first computer, um, I think 14 or 15, you know, the AOL dial up internet. That, um and dude when i when i got that thing and i um uncovered chat rooms um and you could like message people and they would send you pictures and you could like download them in real time um i mean that was the beginning of you know 20 year 20 year battle 20 year addiction wow so go ahead fast forward tell us how it all kind of comes to a head yeah so um Kind of, I'll, I'll just kind of speed through because I, I mean, it, it, it can be hours. So, um, so understanding, you know, I really kind of figure out life all on my own at, at 15. So that takes me into my twenties. Um, you know, I'm competing in bodybuilding. So that's fueling, you know, one obsession, one addiction for me. Good like, looking dude. People are looking at you. You got some, you got some success in business. They're thinking this guy's got, yeah, I was together. making, you know, I was my making girlfriend. I was making six figures, you know, in my early twenties. Yeah. Um, then I got a job, you know, helping to, to launch and grand open gyms here in Tampa. So I became kind of like a figure in the community that was associated with fitness. Um, 
yeah, I mean, so so the nightlife scene was there. The girls were never, you know, never really an issue. I mean, I've dated, you know, pro fitness models and and some of the most beautiful women in in the world. Um, but it was oh, the porn was always 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 there like literally like so yeah tell me about that so you have because i'm curious your if you know your 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 side of it so you have a hot girlfriend why are you looking at porn because that's what some some guys are going to be thinking your dating is i know some people might look at porn because maybe they can't get the hot girl but you have the hot girl yet you're still looking at porn tell me about it yeah there was i mean there was times where i thought okay i'm gonna i'm gonna watch porn and i'm gonna jack off and masturbate because it's gonna actually allow me to last longer and sex. So that was one thing that I was, I was telling myself. Um, and truthfully, and I know you've experienced this, like when you're not with the right person, like it doesn't matter how hot they are. I mean, 100%, yeah. um, I mean, and, and really, really that, that is the case. Um, I was trying to fill a void in my relationship because I was, not with the right person. So to me, it was like having sex with someone else, but without really cheating. Yeah. And, and, and then, and we can get into, you know, we can definitely get into, you know, kind of some of the severe, you know, side effects that, that come with it, but it got to the point where what I was watching was so, uh, I didn't get super, super stream. Like I've had conversations with guys that have gone down some really weird rabbit holes. Um, I definitely had some, some fetishes and things that I enjoyed watching. Um, so when I tried to take that and then duplicate it in, in real life, um, and I got, and I got rejected because it just wasn't something that maybe she wasn't comfortable with at the time. It's like, well, fine, I don't need you. Cause I'm just going to get it over here. Um, yeah. so it kind of just became a way to just, it just, it just, it just, it just filled a, a need. It, it just, it, it satisfied me in a way that that sex didn't. Wow. That's crazy. Cause I, I mean, there's a couple things. things. Uh, one, I have a, I have a friend and he's, he's married and he got really into, he was just got, he was a sex addict, got into the porn, you know, pretty heavily. And it got to the point and he's not gay, mm. but it got to the point where he was having to watch gay porn to get off. And, and I hear that that's actually a common occurrence for people because it's got to get more it has to be more it has to progress it has to get more twisted yeah what, you know t- to the point where you're just watching shit that's just completely crazy yeah i mean just just think about it with with any level of addiction you know an alcoholic for instance an alcoholic doesn't start their journey as an alcoholic drinking you know a quart of whiskey every night they probably started you know drinking some beer then right. they escalate that, you know, from a six pack to 12, then they escalate it to 18. Then they're going on to, you know, some, some liquor and then it escalates and escalates and escalates to the hardest liquor drug addicts, you know, weed is the gateway drug, whatever, but you know, you, you start with one thing and then you escalate it to, to more party recreational drugs. And then you get to the point where you're so fixated on getting that fix on getting that hit that you don't care about the enjoyment. You're just seeking the quickest, hardest drug that's gonna that's gonna get you there so yeah with an analogy yeah with porn and in in the way that it's triggering and firing different mechanisms in your brain different neurotransmitters is realizing every like every image every sex act is like releasing this dopamine 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 over time it's like if you are constantly like if you just constantly are spinning a wheel over time the grinds in that wheel are gonna like they're gonna get worn down so your dopamine sensors are the same way, dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Well, over time, in order to create that same small dopamine surge, you need to raise the level of what you're consuming. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that is why it's, it's as great. And, I, and there's, there's a handful of books back here that I've read, but one I've of the alarming- a, I've done a little research on it, you know, like no fap and yeah. for anyone that's watching, it basically means no jerking off, no, no male masturbation and no fat. But it talked about pornography and they call it, I've heard it referred to as the new tobacco Mm. because, you know, people, they thought it was harmless tobacco. They thought was harmless for years. And then they come to find out, oh shit, uh, inhale and smoke is not good for you. Um, But there was, what I learned about it was that you get this unnatural flood of dopamine when you look at pornography that is similar to like heroin and your brain, which is trying to regulate, I guess it's homeostasis is the term. It's trying to achieve this you know, level of 
normalcy. It lowers the amount of receptors of dopamine receptors yeah. in your brain, which means now it takes more dopamine from just normal shit just to, to give you the good. same amount of enjoyment. So yeah. like if you're just having a, just, you know, a normal good day, you're not getting the same level of enjoyment from just normal things. And now you're depressed yeah. and you can't, and you, maybe you don't even understand why you're depressed. And this is, this is why is that you, and you know more about this than I do, but is yeah. That and then it, no, that's 100%, 100% accurate. It's like you, you are so fixated on, it's not that you're fixated. It's that you're chemically wired that that is what brings you joy. You know, that's, that's your reward kind of ple- dopamine is pleasure. So that's what brings you pleasure. So yeah, you literally wear that down to where the normal things in life, like just the smell of fresh air or the, the, the sun, you know, hitting you like, those things that like now, like that's what makes my day. Like when I step out in the morning, it's like, oh, thank you, God. Like, you know, this is amazing. But you get okay. so wrapped up that you lose joy and you lose the zest for life. So now you're in the state of depression. So now let's connect the dots and let's see where this is going to take you to. So a person that's depressed, they're going to look for ways to, to mask those feelings. So what they're seeing now as porn addiction is starting to to kind of gain some traction. It's still actually on the clinical side of things. It actually isn't in the same level of addiction as like alcohol and drugs. Hopefully we can get it there soon. But what ends up happening is when guys are really struggling with porn addiction to, to fight their depression, to fight their anxiety, they're now seeking out other substances. So you're seeing a higher level of men that are struggling with porn addiction, fall into alcoholism, fall into drug addiction, falling to suicide because you you're in this state of depression mm-hmm. and the only the only way you know how to mask these feelings is through exterior chemicals Man, um, that's good so, so yeah so go ahead go with your so basically i, I want to get to the port the part where you kind of um you know we're ready to call it quits and you you know you, i know a little bit about your story obviously but i want to hear some of the things I don't know, I know you, you, you know, you confessed it to your girlfriend at the time. So tell me about that. Yeah. So I, you know, we, we've shared it here, you know, a handful of times, like, you know, God was working in my life, you know, I I can look back now and just see him throughout the course of my life. Like God was there. He was keeping me out of that. He was, but I wasn't, I wasn't born a Christian. I I didn't grow up one. Um, So for me, it was all, it was all Frank. Like I'll, I was the most selfish. I, and I wore my selfishness as like a badge of honor. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm selfish. Watch what I'm about to do. Like it was, that was who I was. Um, so, you know, through, through bodybuilding. And then I had, I had a business that started succeeding and then about three years into it really collapsed. So this is, this is me at about 28 29 now. Um, so I was kind of looking at what the next kind of business endeavor was, was going to be for me. Um, so I was ready to get into like the online marketing space. I work mostly what I do now is kind of umbrellaed under kind of online digital marketing. Uh, so back in 2000 and the end of 2016, um, I was seeking out a, a business coach. Uh, I was ready to launch a, a fitness business online. I was seeking some mentorship to kind of help me piece it all together. Um, so, so I, I hired a coach. Um, his name is Vince, Vince Almani. We worked together at the beginning of, uh, 2017 attended event in, in July of uh, July of 2017. So it was a fitness business mastermind. Um, and at the time I'm Frank bodybuilder, like doing this thing on my own, you know, not a Christian, like not a, not a believer, not a non-believer. I was that guy that kind of like, if the conversation was was going on, you know, if there was maybe a believer debating with a non-believer, I just kind of hood up, like stood on the side and said, you guys kind of battle that out. Like, I'm not ready to have that conversation. I was just kind of, I avoided the whole topic. So I, so I uh, joined this mastermind, fly up to Toronto, meeting, you know, digital marketing, Facebook, all, you know, all the business stuff. During that group, during that weekend, uh, the guy running the, the guy running the event, Vince had his father, uh, come up and speak to us. So his dad has been a pastor for 35 years. Um, this was really kind of the first time that I was aware of spending time with Christian men. So I'm Mm -hmm. in a room for an entire weekend, just hanging out, 
with men that just put their faith like on their sleeve and they're like, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. And they were just, they proudly, you know, put their faith in front of their business. Um, still like not about it. I'm like, we're cool. We'll, we'll do business. Uh, but when I came back to Tampa over the next couple of months, there was a handful of those guys that now are some of my best friends in the world. Like we connect every week. Uh, we do, we're part of a men's group. We do workouts together. But as I came back, they started to kind of bring me into, into their world. And it started very kind of casually. It was like, Hey, just come work out with us. Hey, come help us shoot, you know, some training videos. Hey, after, you know, after the workout, we're going to have lunch. And then it was like over months and months and months, it's like, they just brought me into, into their lives. Yeah, and, man, I love that. Uh, these men were, you know, a few years older than me in terms of like their years, but in terms of like where they were in life, it's like, they were like decades ahead of mm -hmm. me. Um, family men, you know, businessmen serving the community just doing all the right things um fathers they were they were they were fathers first and began to realize like these are these are the type of men that i always thought that i was supposed to be i didn't have the examples so i didn't know the path to get there but i knew that th that's that's how i like when i envisioned a family that's how the family kind of operated together you, you, do you, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so as I'm, you know, struggling to kind of get this business off the ground and I'm spending time with these men. So they're really feeding into me. And it's like, when I'm with them, it's like something's different. There's, there's like a different energy in the world when these guys are around. Um, I was, I was with it. I was living with a girl at the time. Um, we had been living together, obviously having sex together um, but the relationship just wasn't really much beyond, beyond that. And I can remember, uh, this is probably September of 2018. So yeah, this is like a year, about a year and a half of after being in that group. You know, I had friends that I was seeing on a regular basis. Like I was connecting with the business coaches. I can remember standing in the kitchen at our, at our old place. Like I said, the business wasn't really taken off like I thought it was. Like I, I thought I was doing everything the right way. It just it wasn't catching traction. Stephanie and I were were struggling, my girlfriend at the time. We just couldn't get things figured out. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing everything that all these guys are telling me to do. Like, like, why is it like what like what is going on? I said, Steph, I think we need to go to church. <laughs> now Steph had Steph had grown up uh, in the Catholic church. She had gone to Catholic school. Um, so she had kind of got turned away from it in her, you know, early adulthood, like so many people do that, that come up in the Catholic church. So it was one of those things. She's kind of like, sure. If you think so, like, I, you know, I'll support you in this. Um, but we didn't really talk anymore beyond that. It was kind of one of those things. Like, and I can remember it, like in the kitchen, it was nighttime. I said this, she goes, yeah, it sounds like it could be a good thing. And then we kind of just never, never brought it up again. Um, a few, a few months later, so that was September. So actually about a month and a half later, I have a buddy that's that's flying down to flying down to Orlando, which is just about an hour drive from where I'm at in Tampa. So so Josh lives up in Pennsylvania. So he's like, he's like, hey Frank. And I met Josh in that mastermind. He was one of the first people that I connected with in that in that fitness mastermind. He said, Hey Frank, I'm coming down, uh, coming down to Orlando. Why don't you drive over on whatever day? You know, meet me, you know, meet me uh, for lunch. We'll, we'll go downtown. We'll have lunch. We'll hang out this and that. I was like, awesome, dude. Super excited. Can't wait to see you thinking. I'm just going to drive over, you know, he and I will talk shop. We'll talk business, sports, whatever. Um, well, Josh had came down here with a, with a different plan. Um, <laughs> he came down here to, to share the gospel with me for the first time. And I can remember sitting in a steakhouse, uh, off of church street in Orlando. Um, we, we get there and and the first question Josh asked me is, he goes, because he, he knew I was struggling. Josh was that guy that, like, we talked weekly. So he knew about my struggles with my relationship. He knew any any struggles on the business side. He he knew everything. He was that person that I went to. I felt so comfortable with him. Like, I shared everything, almost everything with him. Um, so I can remember sitting down across from him at the table, and, and he's like, Frank, he's like, how's your relationship with your father? And he just bluntly asked me this question. And he and I never, never really, you know, never really talked about, about that. But, you know, I, I get into it that 
he was there. He wasn't maybe, you know, the, the perfect example, you know, in terms of like what it meant to be a man, this and that. I love, I love my dad to that. I, I spent time with him yesterday. So I, I don't want this to come across as a, um, a talk around bashing him because I do, I love him. He, he did the best that, that he knew how to. Um, but I can remember like Josh telling me that it was all going to be okay because of this guy named Jesus and, and what he did for me. Um, so that, I don't even know how many, that was hours and hours, you know, he shared it, he shared it all with me. And because I had planted that seed like a month and a half ago, like, like I was ready. He's like, he's like, are you, are you ready to, you know, accept Christ into your life as your Lord and savior? And I said, absolutely. So, so we walked, you know, we walked out of the restaurant, we found a little park in downtown Orlando outside of a history museum. And, uh, and prayed and gave to my and gave my life to Christ on October twenty second of two thousand and eighteen. It's awesome. So that was the beginning of my new life as a Christian. Did you feel something right away? Like you know, I'm, I'm, did you feel a weight lifted off, or did you notice any tangible results or you know differences? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. And I know you talked about it on mine that it was instantly. Well, I felt I, I was really aware of God's presence, but it wasn't like if any, I didn't feel like a weight lifted. If anything, I felt a weight put on me. Put cause on. It, yeah. Cause it was like, Oh God, this is hard. Like this, you know, discipline thing is really hard. Yeah. I wasn't used to living that way, but I was just curious if you felt any kind of like, you know, cause some people do, some yeah. people definitely feel that weight lift, but you said, so, so basically you make this decision well, first off, I really, I just feel it's always so interesting to me about how God orchestrates circumstances leading up to him introducing himself to people, you know, like, so here he is working in your life. I really like, I, I really like these guys because they didn't invite you to church. They just were like, Hey, let's hang out. You know, let's just do life together. And um, I often say that with city fam, a lot of see, see a lot of people meet the Lord through city fam and it's very uh, organic. Like we don't really, it's not like anybody's there sharing the gospel, you know, like, we're just like, let's hang out, let's do life together. And then, you know, it comes up in conversations, you know, you'll hear people start talking about, oh, I was praying about this, or you can't it, it, inadvertently, if you get some Christians yeah. together, they're going to start talking about things. And then people hear it. And next thing you know, they're just like, it's like what you said, where you felt something different when you were with these guys. And, you know, I think that that really, and that goes back to like something I heard in church this past weekend when the original word for the church wasn't like a building. It was the ecclesia, it was the people, it was a gathering of people. And Jesus even said, where two or three people come together, there I am, right? So like these guys were just together and you come into their presence and you feel something, something's different. Like, I don't know what it is, but I feel different when I'm with these guys. And yeah. I just think that that's really cool, man. Yeah. And, and, and Mike, the, the, the founder of critical bench, which is, you know, kind of the head of, of the group. So they, they're an online publishing company. I connected you with, with them today, but they have a gym here, tons of online content, YouTube, eBooks, this and that, well, they have apparel. So they started giving me these critical bench shirts and without even knowing it at first, like 90% of their shirts have some scripture <laughs> written on it. So here I'm wearing these shirts like to and from the gym and in and around town. And it's like, I, I got like, you know, Philippians 413, like on it, or, um, you know, just all these kind of like, like Bible scriptures. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just, it was, it was just grown men, man, like sweaty workout and I'll see you tomorrow. And it's like, give you a hug. And it's like, it was just different. It was just yeah. I heard, different. I heard you saying somebody, you were talking to some, I think it was, maybe your, your first episode of your podcast where your buddy was like, he'd say, he said, I love you to you on the phone before you hung up. And you were like, you didn't. And then you text him. You're like, did, did you just say, I love you? Did, you know, like yeah. kind of busting his balls a little bit. Cause you know, you didn't know how to, how to take it. Yeah. But now was, you, you say, sometimes you'll wake up and you'll just text him. Hey, Hey, I love you, man. And yeah. I'm like, he, he almost made me cry when I heard that because I'm like, dude, that's so good. Like just broke those walls down, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's Josh. So, so that was Josh, October 22nd, 2018. Actually have it right here behind me. He had flown down from Pennsylvania, uh, with a copy of the passion translation, mm -hmm. which is the first Bible that I ever had. And right here, history was made today. Your life will never be the same. 
Josh 1022, uh, Church Street, Orlando, Florida. So, so that was a that was a groundbreaking moment. But I didn't know I didn't know what I didn't know what it meant. Like, okay, I knew that Jesus died for me and I was going to heaven. So I knew that, but I didn't realize that it actually like meant that I had to like start doing some stuff. <laughs> um, literally, like I I drove home from Orlando that night. Like I stopped at the gas station and like grabbed like two roadies like I'm like 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 that was where I was like in my life like I drove an hour while drinking in the car right after you know surrender just 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 was where I was sure sanctification's a process I tell people you yeah know, it takes time yeah so so getting back you know to, to October November returning back to Tampa Josh is like just get in the word he's like I need you to find a church I need you to do this start praying start reading the bible I was like all right like, so I wake up, I'd read, I didn't know what I was reading. I didn't understand it, but I'm like, he tells me to do this. He tells me to do this. Um, so even though I was a bodybuilder, uh, at the end of 2018, my health had really, really taken a turn for the worse for a multitude of reasons. Uh, come to find out we had been living in a town home that had black mold, um, which depending on where people are living, they may not be aware with it. It's not your typical mold that you think of. It's, it's actually can kill you. Like it's so severe uh, that it can literally destroy you from the inside out. And so that had kind of led to me putting on quite a bit of weight. Just, just, I was drinking five, six, seven nights a week, sometimes during the day. So as we turned into 2019, I was at the worst shape in my adult life. I mean, I posted a picture way back on my Instagram, but I was over 20% body fat, just like fat, just sloppy. Like I just, I didn't look like I was a fitness professional. I didn't look like I even knew where the gym was. Um, <laughs> so I needed a radical, radical transformation. Like I needed it for a multitude of reasons. I needed it for me personally, but I also was going to leverage it as a marketing piece. I was like, if I can just do a crazy 30 day transformation, it can kind of kickstart this, you know, this fitness thing for me. Um, so at that time I had been looking and doing a lot of research on the carnivore diets, mm -hmm. um, which we don't have to get into to all that. It's basically, it's a meat based diet, um, tremendous health benefits. Um, a lot of people are curing their depression or are getting rid of autoimmune diseases, this and that, whatever. Um, so I jumped right in. I said, I know all the diets in the world. I've done them all. I've been, you know, sub 5% body fat, but I think this approach Right now, where I'm at is going to be the radical transformation that I need. So in the month of January of 2019, I lost 21 pounds in 30 days. And it was just like, just flushed right off of me. Um, but more than anything, it's like this fog in my brain had like disappeared. Like the clarity, like energy, I didn't need coffee anymore. Like I just literally had like reset everything wow. in my body doing a lot of fasting. I was, you know, fasting 20, you know, 18 to 20 hours a, a day at the time. Mm. Um, and then I got into some, some longer fast. Um, but that was kind of the beginning of me truly, truly breaking free. I think even as a bodybuilder, like you're so attached to food, this attachment to food, like you got to have a cooler everywhere you go. You got to eat Literally, there was every three was, hours. Yeah. yeah, there was there was times in my life I was I can remember I was working in a in a, a very high level sales position. We did uh, phone sales calls. I mean, high high level. I was recruiting and, and doing all this stuff. I would be on the call and I would make up an excuse when my alarm went off with the prospect and say, "Hey, like I got my boss coming." I I'd, I'd lie. I'd make up an excuse because I knew I needed to eat my meal. I was so consumed with it's got to be three hours. If I wait three hours and 10 minutes, I'm going to lose my gains and this and that. So I had this crazy attachment to food. And I think what the carnivore diet for me did is it made me realize that you don't need to eat every three hours. You right. don't need to eat more than once a day. I put muscle on over the course of that 30 days. Uh, so it kind of gave me this like strength, like you can actually break some of these chains. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't realize at the time that I, that one of my chains that needed to be broken was that attachment to food. But when I was able to break it, it's like giving me this like renewed, like sense of strength. Like you can really, really do all of this. I quit drinking, uh, which I'm, you know, 19 months, uh, since I had a drink. Congratulations. Um, man. Thank That's you. Awesome. Um, and I began 
because of a podcast that I listened to with Vince, my, my mentor, he had had a podcast with uh, Dr. Michael John Cusick, who wrote Surfing for God. So I remember listening to, to their podcast and Michael sharing his story and um, everything that, that he's doing. The first time I ever heard a grown man talk about struggles with pornography. Um, so he had kind of like planted this seed in my brain, like, oh, there's like, there's actually a problem with watching and jerking off five times a day. Like, there could I be a negative, was... <laughs> it could be a downside to this. Wait a well, second. because so for me, it, it hadn't caused a problem. I never had an issue getting a girl. So it wasn't like I used porn because I couldn't get chicks, like sleep with pretty much any chick I wanted to. I had a great physique. I was fitness modeling, doing magazines. I was making a great living in my twenties. Like, so there was, there was no real negative consequences to it. So were you depressed at this time and not sure where it was coming from or, or no? Yeah. I, because you were drinking, you said, right during the day. So you were masking so, you, some. You were masking some pain, or you were trying to get away from something, and maybe you just weren't attributing some of this to porn. Because I'm, I'm I trying definitely, to think- I definitely wasn't, and I, yeah. and I think for for me, depression had really been a part of my life for a very long time. Cyclical, yeah. like some right. real low, dark moments. Um, so I never, I never connected it at the moment. I never thought that you know watching porn five times a day is making you unhappy. Like, cause every time I watched it, it made me feel happy. So I just, I wasn't that, I wasn't that, you know, awake. Tuned, that, sure. That yeah. Time. Um, but looking back now, then absolutely. I know that it was, you know, uh, one of the reasons why. So, so I began because of that podcast began searching and, and finding videos and, and reading the books. Um, so that goes on for a few weeks and I'm still not sure like, okay, am I really addicted? Because it's cool. Like, I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm not homeless. I'm not, you know, like, I just I, I did it. I didn't connect it with although I'm doing it way more than I should, and way more than I know I should, like, I still thought because maybe some of the other things like, didn't add up that I was that I was maybe different. Um, so so taking it back to to that group of guys that I was training with on a regular basis, it was after one of our workouts. This is this is now February. So if we if we look at the time the time the time lap here, October is when I uh, give my life to Christ. So we go November, December, uh, quit drinking in January, carnivore diet in January, starting to clean things up, getting you know getting some mental clarity. The beginning of February, actually February fourteenth, it's a Thursday, so Valentine's Day, the day of love. Um, sitting outside the gym with. Uh, after that workout with critical bench sitting in my car with my friend Zach and we're just hanging out, just having a conversation. And, and Zach starts talking about uh, he's doing some, some breathing techniques to help him harness his sexual energy and how it's actually helping him stay off of porn because Zach, um, which people can go listen to my podcast. He was the second episode. Uh, he was a former Marine and, you know, he, he shared how it was actually uh, when he was, overseas and, and he was in active duty that the army kind of like fed his pornography addiction. I've done a few episodes on porn in the military, but so, so here's this, you know, former, you know, former military man, like super strong guy. He's like sharing with me, like, dude, I've been struggling with porn for like seven years and I'm tapping into this breathing thing and it's helping me harness my energy. And I was like, wait, like you have a problem with, with porn? Really? I was like, dude, I got to share this with you. It was like, I've been, I've been doing all this research and reading up on this. Like I've struggled with this since I was like 12, 15, like I, you know, whatever the age was. And that was the first time I remember having a conversation with him. And it just, we talked about vulnerability at, at the beginning and how natural it was. Like that was it. That was February 14th was the first time I shared any of this with anybody. And, and this is 2019. Yeah. This is last year. Yeah. And you talked about, did I feel, uh, did I feel any different, uh, in October? I didn't, but I felt something different then when I was able to share it with him and not have him look at me like, dude, man, up, like, just get it together. Like, like right. for him to embrace me in the way that he did and be like, dude, it's okay. Actually, like all of us are struggling with this. Mm. Um, so we kind of had a conversation then and there and about it. Um, and I can remember telling him like 
dude, I'm done with it. Like, I'm done. Like, never, ever, ever again. Like, this is it. And let me ask you a question. Have you not since February of 2019? Wow, dude. That's yeah. impressive. We're, I want to get into this because I, uh, you know, like I've been on this abstinence journey for a minute. And I'm like, I want to meet the guy that's been a, been abstaining for long periods of time that hasn't jerked off or looked at porn. Now, I'm not, I don't know if you maybe you haven't jerked off, but I'd like to like to wow. Cause I want to talk, I want to talk about how, cause yeah, I mean, for I mean, me, I'll it's wait. been, it's been, a, it, you know, I've gone long periods of abstinence, but it, you know, like it has never been easy, you know, wake longest, up with an oyster in my shorts. Sometimes. <laughs> right. No, I, I've definitely had that happen too, but you know, like, I don't know how many thousands of hard ones I've had to ignore. I just have to like you, I have to, you as a Christian man, you kind of just have to forget that you have a penis. Yeah. You know, like, so don't touch it. Don't think about it because unless you're married, you, you just can't do nothing with it. You know, like it's tough. It's tough to, you know, do that for a long, a long period of time. And, and for a year and a half is a clip. So I, I really want to get into that. But go ahead. I want to let you finish that because I have a couple more questions I want to ask. Yeah. You. So, so I remember sitting sitting with him in in that moment and being like, "Dude, I'm done with this forever." I'm like, "But in order for this to happen, there's like a few things that need to kind of come out of this." And I told him like I needed him, like his support. I needed him to be there for me. I'm like Zach. I don't know what these next couple of days and weeks are going to be, but like I need you to be kind of there for me. He's like 100%, brother. I'm like, the, the second most important thing is like, I need to share this with Stephanie. So like I said, Stephanie and I had relationship. We were living together, you know, like thought that we, I thought she was the one. I thought that yeah. like our life, I thought that we were just in a stage of our life that was the beginning of something much, much greater. I was like, I need to share this with her because she needs to know ultimately who I am. Um, so I can remember that drive home that night. It's like, I got 45 minute drive, like across one of the bridges here in Tampa. Um, I'm like contemplating, like, you know, the enemies in my head. He's like, you don't need to do this. Like, dude, just, just go back and do your thing. And I was like, maybe I won't tell her, like, maybe I'll just keep this to myself and I'll do it on my own. So I struggled with that for like the next day until, until Friday the 15th. Um, and I can remember like when I, when I stepped in and, and told her, so I, you know, I'm talking to you on, on one of my computers. I got another screen here. I had a separate laptop that was like my porn laptop. Cause I, you know, I lived with other girls. So like, I knew that they searched history. I knew that they'll check my phone. So I was like, well, she doesn't know how to log into this past, you know, log into this computer. It's in the closet. So she thinks it's dead anyways. It only comes out when, you know, when I'm watching, like, this is how far, like I went, like I had like a routine. So wow. I walked into the room where she was at and like, I got this computer like under my arm and I was like, I'm like, Steph, I need to, you know, kind of share something with you. Now she knew that I'd watched porn. Like she knew, like, cause I tried to like bring her in and like, Hey, let's watch this. Like just to kind of see like how far I could take it. So it wasn't a surprise to her that I watched porn, but when I got into like the severity of it and I Were was you actually, crying, I was, is it, you told, I, I heard in the, you know, in another podcast where she, she was crying and she I was, was wondering if you were, because I imagine you were probably pretty emotional, so she could feel that. Yeah. I think I started crying first. Yeah. Because she had this look of, like, I don't even know. Like, she's, I mean, she's very, like, innocent, like, you know, innocent girl. Um, so she didn't know. Like, like, so I'm sharing this with her, and I was like, I was like, but I need you to know, Stephanie, like, that it's over. Like, this is it. Like, I'm done with this. And the only way that this is going to happen is if I destroy this computer. So I had a laptop and I literally like ripped the laptop in two pieces, like took it and just ripped it apart. And she's like, so I like walked away, like, and, and like go outside, like, oh, cause I told Zach, I'm like, dude, I got to tell Stephanie and I'm going to call you tomorrow to let you know. So I shot a quick IG video, shot it to Zach. I shot another video and that video goes to Josh. So Josh is, you know, the one that, that, that brought me to Christ. He didn't know about, the porn thing like this is the one thing i had to share with him so he and i we do marco polo i don't know if you're familiar with the marco polo app so i pull this video up i'm like josh it's like i need to share something with you kind of share the whole you know story how i've been struggling for 20 years what just happened i show him the computer as it's going in you know as it's going in the garbage um and then i look at the phone i still have the video i look at the phone and i was like 
Josh, I don't know what is going to come out of this, but I know that this is the beginning, something pretty epic. And like, I shut it off. So, so that was it. Like he didn't respond or anything, go back upstairs. Like, you know, it was a Friday. So it was regular work. I think Steph left for that day. Um, and I always tell a story. It's like, and then, and that, is happily ever after. And it's like, that's not the case. So, um, a few days later, like I'm going without porn now for like the first time, you know, pretty much in my entire life without porn or sex for a period of days. So I'm like, detox up energy and yeah, de detoxing for, for lack of a better word. So I'm like super aggressive and angry and I start, you know, fighting with Stephanie and trying to intimidate her. So we end up getting this huge fight. I end up like, bashing some walls, putting my hand through it, shattering like all the bones in my hand. Um, and at that point, like I collapse and I'm just like screaming at her, just like, just like taking all of my aggressiveness, anger, just everything out on her, just like a complete psycho. I'm just like, leave me alone. She like, she like picks me up and she's like, you're being such an idiot, but like, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to love you no matter what. And I was like, wow. So she like, fights with me on the way to the emergency room. I'm like, just take me to the clinic. We just need to put a bandage on it. She's like, no, like you need to go to the emergency room. So she takes me to the clinic. She's like, clinic looks at me like, get out of here. You need to go to the emergency room. So we're sitting in the waiting room for like nine hours. It was like a Sunday or whatever. And at that moment, I felt God's presence because I had been you know, praying and meditating. Like, I'm like, I don't know, like loss at this point i'm like i just did this thing that i thought i was supposed to do and now i'm screaming and i'm breaking walls like like what is going on mm. and i can remember being so calm and chill in his presence that when they took me back to the room and they took my like heart rate they're like what's wrong with you? like i had a heart rate of like 42 like it was so i was so calm and chill because literally like i said i felt god was like calm down relax like i got you Right. Through this. That's awesome. So long story, you know, my hand is busted, this and that bodybuilder. I go to the, you know, go to the doctor the next day. He's like nine weeks, no gym. I'm like, what? He's like, I don't want you in the gym for nine weeks. I was like, no doc, you don't get it. Like I can like, I'll attach a cable to my elbow. Like I don't need my hand. I can do lateral raises like this, like a biomechanics expert. So I know how to build muscle without like your hand. He's like, no, I don't want you in the gym for nine weeks. I was like, I'm going to lose all my muscle, <laughs> which I did. Um, but going back to what I said at the beginning, how I built this shield, this like monstrous physique as a way mm. to protect myself from the world. This was God's time. This was his moment to say, mm -mm, like, that's not who you are. So yeah. he literally broke me down. And it was in those weeks and months after that, and I started to really share what was going on and having more conversations like we're having today. I started to go through all the men in my life, like all these men that I looked up to. And I was like, Hey man, like, I need you to know like who I was when you met me and what I've gone through. So I would do like coffee meetings where I would be, you know, share this story with these men and, and we'd break down, we start crying or I do zoom calls and they'd all start crying with me. And it was those moments again, where it's like, I'm sharing all of this like vulnerability and instead of like being pushed away, it was like, no, come here. Like, actually, like, I'm going to, I'm going to like put my arms around you. And every guy I was sharing it with, like, it didn't matter. Like CEOs, doctors, lawyers, pastors, there's like, they're like, oh, I've struggled with it too, man. Like, you're not the only guy in the world. And it gave me this sense of like, wow, like, what have I been running from for like 20 years? Like if I should, would have just like mm. took this on, like decades ago, like it would have all been different, but it gave me that strength and power that like these conversations are, are life transforming. Um, yeah. So I want to, I mean, a couple things. And one, I was like, there's, you know, there's a principle in the Bible. It says, confess your sins one to another that you might be and pray for each other that you might be healed. So there's a, a lot of people don't know, don't know that verse. I don't think they think that, you know, they sin, they, they should just, you know, confess it to God. But it says you're supposed to really confess to God for forgiveness, but you confess to other people for healing. And I believe that that's a spiritual principle because um, if you don't confess it to other people, it's very easy to make it. You know, you can just be you can just try to pretend like you got it all together, you know, but God's like, nah, no, because he's not going to let you get over it until you tell other people. 
because he wants he doesn't want us to walk around like hypocrites, you know, to pretend like we got it all figured out. He wants you to be transparent. And that's the only way that you can, you know, get over certain sins. So I think the fact that, you know, like that you you were able to confess that to people, maybe may the thing that really is able to has, has helped you this last year and a half, you know, and um, I also was thinking when you were talking about how God took the to working out away from you. So for me, when I got saved, I was, I was probably the most popular person in my city. Seriously. Like I was running the nightlife. I just, I've been in the phone book. I was a stripper and then God, you know, humbled me. He took away, he basically, I had to quit stripping. I had to quit promoting, broke up with my girlfriend was, you know, abstinent for the next, you know, six years, but, but specifically for a year and a half, he didn't even let me work. He just wouldn't tell me what to do. So I had $20,000 in the bank, which isn't a lot of money, but my babe was enough to last me a year and a half. And he gave me a job working the front desk at a gym and I was making eight something an hour. I was so happy just to work because I had not worked for a year and a half. I didn't had literally for a year and a half. I did nothing except just wait for him to tell me what to do. And I, you know, here I'm like went from King Dingling to being nobody working a front desk at a gym and man, it was humbling, you know, like, and I watched this, I, I, you know, I created this persona of who I was Rob. And I had this, I was like leading this really messy parade almost like is what it felt like. I had a lot of people following me and I just stopped partying and I thought, you know, God was going to give me some great calling and I just, and he just didn't tell me anything. He just sat me down and he just said, you just sit there. And I watched the parade kept going without me. And I was like, man, I was like, wanted to go like, (laughs) you know, and he just took, and it just, so it was like the thing that I, that gave you the value the most for Mm -hmm. you was the bodybuilding and he broke your hand. And for me, it was, it was being popular and being the man. And he just was like, he took it from me and man, it hurt. But, um, so, uh, so people, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be people that see this and they're not going to be convinced yet, maybe of the porn. So you you now coach men on how to get free from this addiction yeah. through faith and fitness, like we mentioned in the introduction, but what kind of like negative effects have you seen for people that are in the throes of the porn addiction, their porn addiction? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll share personal, you know, um, you talked about, you know, a year and a half with, without sex and, and, you know, without, without porn or or masturbating, um, the first, you know, six, eight months, it wasn't really that hard. You know, I, uh, I have lived with, I, I know what P I E D feels like porn induced erectile dysfunction. Mm. Um, I had gotten to the point for me where, in order for me to to have sex, like I had a I had a cocktail of Viagra, Cialis, and testosterone. Like I mean, like a daily cocktail of Viagra and testosterone. Um, you know, no Viagra and Cialis. Testosterone was like a weekly regimen. Um, so I mean, I experienced like the actual inability uh, to to get an erection due to um, an overuse of, of porn. So when I when I stopped in February, like I got off of all tests. I, you know, my, my test plump plummeted to like low 200s and probably was under 200 at one point when I got it tested, it was like 210. Um, so I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't having to hide erections all the time. Like you were. It, was, it was easy. Not, it was easy not to go then. <laughs> yeah. I have a Christian buddy, a buddy that's a believer that got married and he was, you know, he was looking at porn when he was single. And it, it, and the thing is, is honestly, it's easy to justify. You know, like, cause you think to yourself, well, who am I really hurting? You know, like I'm not having sex. I know God says it's a sin cause I'm lusting in my mind's eye or whatever, but you're like, who am I hurting? You know, that, and that's, that's the way that you justify it. But he had the same thing. Where, that's okay. <laughs> he had the same thing where he got married and he, and he uh, was having a hard time getting it up. And I'm like, which is crazy. Cause it's like, you're watching something that's not even real on the screen and you ha- then you have the real thing in front of you and you can't get an erection. Yeah. So there's a couple of reasons of, of why that's going to happen. So what they've done with brain scans, uh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. They've actually had people 
set up to MRI scans while watching porn. And it literally, it triggers a different response in your brain. So when you see a person, when you see a naked human being, like in real life, like if I had, a, you know, your wife standing here and she took her clothes off, your brain is going to trigger one response. When you see pornography, it doesn't trigger the response that responds to humans. It's, it's the response of objects. So you're literally objectifying like in mm. your brain, like that's where the objectification through pornography comes from is it's literally triggering the object transmitter in your brain, not the human. Wow. Transmitter. So, so that's one of the reasons why um, is it's, it's literally conditioning yourself to, to respond mm -hmm. to, to others. And, and then we talked about it with the, you know, the, the pleasure, the dopamine, like you just over, over stimulate it to where the, the real thing, like it just doesn't, it doesn't do it for you. I've heard stories of guys that like can't get an erection without their hands on a keyboard. So, wow. so yeah, we're, you know, I, I think we need to, to go. Yeah. I know it's actually into understanding like how humans are, are, but 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 humans are just their their habits you know they're creatures of habits so we develop these habits and routines and disciplines that that's what we get used to and if we over use one you know one response mechanism that becomes our default yeah so today when i was uh i, I shared one of your videos on my instagram and yeah. on my facebook and right before I, sh I looked at that video somebody in my stories posted something about um pornography and they were talking about Pornhub specifically, the website Pornhub, and how you don't need a government issued uh, email address to post videos, and how a lot of the you know the, the videos that are being posted there are being are generated. people that have been trafficked or they're being raped or against their will or drugged or whatever. And when you think about that, you know, and, I, and then literally the next thing I watched was your video, and it was the exact same message, and I'm like, wow. So you think about that. This is someone's daughter, you know, sister maybe they're someone's mother potentially being forced against their will. And you're sitting there jerking off to someone being raped. And you think about that. That's, that's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. That came, that came um, really as a result of a conversation I was having uh, way back, like episode 10 or 11. So we had a, we had a guest on um, author of recovered on purpose, Adam, Adam Black Dunton. And he shared a story on my show where he was having a conversation with a doctor um, at an event, the doctor was talking about the spirit of drugs. So he shared the story of, you know, when you snort a line of cocaine, like you're snorting so much more than that little white strip. It's like that little white line that's sitting there in front of you started as a plant somewhere in South America. So probably a slave working in that, you know, uh, field picking that then it's put through a manufacturer then it's through cartel then there's drug money there's you know there's all these kind of negative spirits that are fueling that to where at one point you literally get there and it's like you're snorting so much more than coke you're snorting hate greed murder like all of these evil evil spirits and it was in that moment i was like dude like same thing is going on behind the scenes you know in pornography like whether or not the actress is there willingly that doesn't mean that everything is taking place willingly. Like I've heard dozens of conversations with porn stars that have now left and are, you know, at the forefront of really being a voice. It's like, yeah, they sign up for one thing, but then they show up and it's like, nope, you're going to get run through this. And it's like, you know, the abuse that takes place, the drugs that take place, like the amount of, you know, women that you're watching that are just out complete. Like they, one of the, one of the girls was like, I was on so many drugs just so I could numb the feeling of what was actually happening so they're actresses they're they're pretending to enjoy this and like they're literally like they're getting beaten and brutalized and they're just like it, it, yeah I, I think about it now and it's like i it almost makes me sick to the pit of my stomach that i used to participate in that but that's just the one thing but yeah the the whole trafficking piece like that's a whole nother conversation that that can be had i was a part of um the trafficking hub uh, a few weeks back they did a huge petition i think they were trying to get like 200, 250,000 signatures to try to take down Pornhub because yeah, I think it's like 60% of the content on Pornhub is user generated content, which means just you and I can just upload constant videos. So we can be running, you know, sex rings and have, you know, girls just one after another coming through this. And yes, yeah, some of them may get taken down, but 
the amount of volume that's on Pornhub, like it would take you like 160 something lifetimes watching continuously to be able to see all the porn that's that's on Pornhub. So understanding that, yeah, you're watching what you feel is a very innocent act, but if you want to connect what is going on all the way to get it to where you're seeing it, you just like, you kind of, like if you really sat there and thought about it, I think it would really question like, your yeah. humanity, if you're willingly still going to participate in it. So let me ask you this. I, w- I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about what you're doing with your clients to help them stay off of, of this. And then secondly, I want to talk about some of the positive benefits that they're seeing from being off of it. So mm-hmm. can you tell me, like, I, I know you and your, your, when you and I had our uh, podcast interview, you asked me and I, that covenant uh, article has really helped me a lot. I didn't just, you know, full disclosure, I didn't look at porn for the month of June. Um, I think, I think I, I may have jerked off like one, the first day or two of July and then I signed another covenant and I haven't looked at it again for the month of July. So, um, you know, that's something that's helped me and I'll be happy to share that article with anybody that wants uh, to know more about that, that covenant. Um, but yeah, I would, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love for you to talk about what you're doing with your clients to help them have long-term success or what you've done uh, to stay off. Cause now I'd imagine that your testosterone levels are bounced back and it's probably not as easy as it was the first few months when you came off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great, great, great questions. Um, and for anybody that's, that's, that's looking uh, for, for a guide, I have a, I have a free guide that's out there. It's uh, seven steps to living life without porn. Um, it's the seven step guide.com. Uh, it's completely free. So just put your email address in and, um, it's a, it's a seven step process. So, so when I started, is that the number seven or the spelled out? It's spelled out the seven step guide.com. It's all, it's all spelled out. Okay. And I'll put that in, I'll put that in the notes here. So yeah, when I was towards the end of, towards the end of last year, you know, last year was all about me, me finding my freedom, me, you know, really taking back control of my life. We launched a podcast without really intent behind it. I just wanted to be able to, to share the message, to have conversations, to just bring awareness to it. But towards the end of last year, like I had a lot of people saying, Frank, like, like you have the, you have the ability to help a lot of men. Like I was like, this, this was God calling me to do this. So I had a background as a health and fitness coach. So I needed to figure out, okay, how can I, how can I utilize, you know, my life's, education and work, uh, but then bring it into this space. So I was looking at what other guys were, were doing out there. You know, I've, I've now gone through and, and I've gotten, you know, a handful of different, you know, uh, addiction counseling and addiction coaching certification. So I could understand the root causes of the issue. Um, but our whole philosophy here is we don't treat the addiction. We coach the person that is struggling with the addiction. So, where a lot of like your 12 steps, you know, a lot of other programs out there, it's like, you got to go in, you got to raise your hand. You got to identify, I had this problem. It's got control over me and I'm never going to be able to actually grow out of it. I must surrender to it completely. And hopefully I can pray and, you know, not fall victim to it. It's like, I don't fully agree with that approach. Like I don't want you every day telling yourself that you're a porn addict. Love that. I don't want you constantly reminding of who you are. We're focused on, becoming the person that is no longer addicted to porn. If you're going to end your battle with porn addiction, you must become. It's funny because I was reading your book this morning and you talked about becoming, I think it's towards the end of the book, becoming a new person. And you like italicized the word becoming. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very big on becoming the person that is no longer addicted to porn. Um, So, so a lot of the guys, we, we start with obviously cleaning the closet out, you know, like, you got to remove all the triggers and things like, you know, you may have to put a, you know, a filter up on your computer. You know, if you got videos and this and that, like eliminate those. Like I've had guys like have to remove people from their life, certain relationships. That's a big part of it. So we're going to look at, you know, all the things that are enabling you at this point and make sure we put barriers in and around there. And then from there, we're really focusing on how has porn prevented you from truly living the life that you were created to live, truly stepping into all that you were created to be. So what areas are you lagging in? And then let's build a growth centric, you know, program. Let's build a, let's build a a vision to help us, to help us get there. So 
it's 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 really about you know building building the life where it, it no longer has the temptations it's it's they're always going to be there you know the triggers are always going to be there so so you have to put habits and disciplines and mechanisms in place that just bring you more joy and pleasure in life and you got to get back to to truly enjoying life for for all that it is um so that's that's some we we we, we, we do look at a lot of fasting. So because of my background in health and, and fitness, I think that because most guys come into me with porn problems, like they're not, you know, high level bodybuilders, like right. they're not fitness, you know, models, like they don't have the physique that I had. So they're coming to me most of the time, their health is, you know, somewhat in shambles or it's not at the top of the game. And I was like, dude, if you're going to, if you're going to actually be able to fight this battle over here, we need to get you winning the battle with your body first if you're weak if you're weak physically if you're weak mentally if you're yeah. weak here you're not going to have the strength needed to fight this battle so we start there we start with rebuilding your body yeah. then we look at rewiring your brain so how can we reset those dopamine uh neurotransmitters how can we kind of rebring gratitude how can we rebring joy back in your life so we have a lot of you know practices and things we put in place to help you re to rewire your brain so rebuild your body rewire your brain and then reshape your heart. And in order to do that, we look at, you know, we removed old toxic relationships. So what are some new relationships that you need to bring back in? Um, that early morning text thing, like that's a, that's a standard practice that I do with my guys. If you wake up every single morning and the first thing you do is reach out to three people and tell them how much you love them and how amazing it is to have you in their life. Chances are the next thing you're not gonna do is roll over and pull up porno. Like it just, it's just, it's, it's just like it's just not gonna. Yeah. It's not. No, there's happen. a couple things. I, I, you know, I, I love the uh, not having people say they're a porn addict. You know, because I ne personally, I never like that about the program where people say, "Oh, my name is such and such, and I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a drug addict," or, and I'm thinking to myself, "Well." Jesus like healed people from blindness, like mm -hmm. leprosy and all kinds of things. So can he, can he heal, you know, people from being an alcoholic or being a drug addict? Yeah. If, and, if our, if our, if our thoughts dictate our habits, our habits dictate our actions, our actions dictate our life, you know, whatever, however, you know, you want to use that. Well, if your everyday thought is I'm an alcoholic or I'm a, you know, addicted to porn, you're, you're never progressing forward. You're living in, in the past and, and yeah. I've, I've spent too much money, too much time in understanding how the brain works and in the, the development side. So, so I tried to take the world of personal development. It's like high achievers, high performers, like if they're using these principles and tactics to elevate them to the next level, well, let's take these water them down a little bit and let's use them as success principles to help people break out of, of recovery. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, good. it's, I like the fasting piece too. Um, you know, I a lot of people, I mean, if you're not a Christian, you probably don't even really think about the fact that you are a spirit living in a, a body, you know, and, and that, you know, you have, to, if you, if you starve that, that human bot, that body of things at once, you know, it's cause we have all kinds of appetites for things and it, then your spirit becomes stronger and yeah. your spirit and your, your, your flesh are basically always, at war with each other, your spirit wants to do the right thing for the most part. You know, your, your body always wants to do the wrong thing. It doesn't want to work out. It wants to eat like, you know, shitty food. <laughs> it wants to just jerk off and tell you, you know, not doesn't want to work. Right. Does it hates discipline. Um, but when you fast, which is, it sounds like what you're doing with your clients, you strengthen that spirit, man, so that it, it actually has the power to say no to the body. So, what kind of fast are you got? Are you have them doing the carnivore diet or is it just no food or intermittent? What do you Yeah, so so we depending on where they're at in the program, it's 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 gonna vary. Um early stages is a two-day fast. So within the first two weeks, like you're gonna go 48 hours without eating. And at the end of the 48 hours, you're actually gonna write out uh your plan for this program. So mm -hmm. we talked about, you know, your your spirit strengthening. That's a time where I want you to actually put on paper, uh, pen and paper, what are your plans? And like, why did you hire me? Like beyond actually breaking free from the porn, like, like 
we talked about becoming the man. Like, what? It, who is that man? What does his job look like? What does his family life look like? What does his hobbies look like? What is his service looking like? So at the end of that first two day fast, like I have them sit down for an hour or two and kind of map out a vision for their life. Okay. Vision from, is key. Yeah. Then because yeah, if we're if we're trying to to build your life without it, like we got to know the direction that we're going in. Um, you know, is that looking like are you are you aiming to get to get a promotion at work? Are you aiming to, to launch a side business? Are you aiming, you know, to to rebuild your, you know, to rebuild your relationship? So it kind of varies depending upon where the guy is at. So so we'll start with the two days, um, and then we do implement the carnivore diet at the beginning of the program, um, and with that comes a weekly twenty four hour fast for the remainder of the program. So, um, you so know, tell most me about some success them. stories. What have you seen with your clients? Yeah. I mean, guys, guys are, guys are changing lives and, and breaking free. I mean, I'm working with a guy right now. We're coming towards the end of, of our 16 weeks. Uh, we're at, we're at the beginning of month four. Um, that, and, and most of these guys are coming with other issues. You know, um, they, they got drinking problems. They got, you know, drugs problems. Um, you know, one guy in particular, like he kind of like a mid-level kind of manager at his, at his company was helping with marketing and sales. Um, you know, in our time, you know, been promoted to VP of sales, he's crushing it. He's like, he's like, dude, he's like, I don't even understand what's, what's going on. He's like, everybody's telling me like, there's a, there's a vibrant, you know, energy about me and this light. I was like, like, yeah, brother, it's because, because it's working. Um, had another guy that was, you know, this guy was late fifties. Um, you know, his, his wife had, had been struggling with some dementia um, so he, he had kind of justified it as like, I don't really have, you know, my wife that I had for, for the longest time. So I'm going to resort back to, to porn, but, um, we got him, we got him free. And, and he, he told me at, at the end, cause, cause we, you know, we parted ways and he's, he's on his own now we stay on touch, but he's like, and he's like, you kind of gave my relationship back. Although she's in, in the state, he's like, I, I love her more than I, than I ever have. Um, yeah, that that's both of those things are pretty common with no fat where they talk about you'll be more charismatic or something. There's a magnetism when you're when you're not busting nuts where yeah. where people want to like they're drawn to you um, for whatever reason. And even, you know, like I know for a fact that sex transmutation. Is yeah, we talked real, about that. On, yeah, we yeah. talked about that on, on 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 my show. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I. I think it's more with, you know, where we're really building these men up. Like we're building really strong men. I, you know, I don't know if, if you just went without jacking off, like would it all work? Because I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of work, you know, like having these guys like, like reach out to people, you know, like they're, they're serving in the community. Like one of the things just random, you know, like in week five, it's like, I just need you to go buy a coffee for a random person, like without them knowing who you are, like pay for Like, so, you, so you just start, you just start putting, just start putting energy, good energy out into the world. Like people are going to pick that stuff up. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's honestly, dude, it's, it's nothing groundbreaking that we're doing. Um, I think, I think the biggest part is getting the guys to actually raise their hand and say, yeah, I got a problem. Um, and then actually commit to having some accountability and, and work through it. Yeah, man, that consistency and that, um, that routine, you know, yeah. is key. Yeah. And celebrating little successes along the way. That's, that's key too, you know, um, cause it will be some ups and downs. Like you'll go through, you know, weeks where it's like, it was, I was weak, man, like, you know, whatever. But when you get a victory, when you get a win, you know, like let's celebrate yeah. let's, cause we got to re trigger that, that dopamine, that, that reward center. It's important, man. It's so important what you're doing, you know, like nothing has the potential to jack your life up like sex. It really does. There's no, no other sin, which is, why the Bible classifies it in a category all its own. Cause it says all their sins, a person commits outside the body, but a person that sins sexually sins against their own body. So it's a very unique sin. And I believe it's cause it's so destructive enough. It'll, it'll literally just steal your potential. You know, you won't know your purpose. You'll marry the wrong person. You'll, you know, you won't cultivate a community of, of people to come around you that can support you. Even if you do figure out what your purpose is, it really will just take your, all your potential away from you. And it's such a, it's such a hard one to conquer. Like it's where I believe it's harder than any drug. It's harder than any substance. So 
I think it's really awesome what you're doing. And that, so how do people actually work with you? Is it the seven step guide, the first step, or, or do they just reach out to you through your website or how can I? They yeah, right now, um, right now, get that, get that seven step guide. Um, there's, there's ways to, once you're, once you're in kind of that world, there's, there's ways to, to book a call. Um, we're in the process of, you mentioned the rebuilt recovery. So this is in the very early, early stages. Like I literally just filed all the paperwork back in May to get this company up, up and running. So a lot of what we're doing now, it's guys can find me on Instagram um, and, and message me there or follow that seven step guide. We're building out the, the site now. And, and I only have the coaching at this level where it's very, it's high level. It's one-on-one. I mean, it's, it's not cheap. It's not expensive. I mean, but it can change your life. You know, like this guy, for instance, like he, you know, got a $60,000 raise, you know, by, by getting promoted. So it can ultimately change your life. Um, we're, we're building out some other kind of like uh, done for you courses and it will kind of walk you through where it's not as hands on with me. Cause I have had some people that, um, you know, just can't afford it for, for whatever reason. I understand, you know, like, like when you're really dealing with some major stuff, like, finances are, are not always in, in the best place, but yeah, for right now, download that guide. Uh, you can book a call right there with me. That'll also get you on my email list where we're doing newsletters and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the best place to, to really engage with me right now is, is on Instagram, you know, um, and that's the, the superhuman Frank, the superhuman Frank. Yeah. Um, slide up, slide up in those DMS and, <laughs> and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Um, not going to always respond immediately, but, but I do respond to every message that comes in. No, it's awesome. You put out a lot of good content there as well. So, well, man, that's, it's been awesome. Thanks for letting me run over. Cause I know we were probably only supposed to be about an hour and I think we want to close to to an hour and a half, but yeah, I, I had you, I, I thought we were going until nine. So, so I'm good. Okay, cool. I appreciate you, man. This was, do you this work was with any women, any women or no, do you, do you see much of a problem with that? Cause I, I it's becoming more prevalent. Yeah, it's different though. It's it's different. And there's a book, uh, Wired for Intimacy, where he actually talks about the differences with women. So men are uh, men are triggered visually. That's why we watch porn. Um, women's brains operate a little bit differently. They like uh, the the reading. So that's why the, the kind of like sex novels are are a major major thing. Um, I haven't I haven't worked with any women. I've had women reach out to me. Um, I just not sure I'm equipped. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure I could, but there's, there's plenty of men in, sure. that I need to help first. Um, is a seven step guide. Will that help women also? It should. Yeah. Okay. What about a book, a book? We see a book in your future. We do. We talked about that at the beginning. Yeah. I would say the end of the beginning of 2021, I got, I got, a, I got a lot literally launching an entire company right now. So, um, the book, the book is in the future. Yes. Awesome. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on Frank, dude. It's been awesome. Yeah, man. No, thank, thank you, bro. I really, really appreciate this. Cool, man. Well, everybody, uh, if it blessed you, if you think there's somebody out there that, that needs to hear this information, you can tag them in a comment, you can share it. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to, uh, Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell notification so you see the future videos. And uh, see you next week on Kowalski Analysis.